hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for the Society for Experimental Biology Christmas Lectures 2022. So we are a society for scientists who research plant, animal and cell biology. Uh, my name is Anna, I'm the Outreach and Engagement Officer. And today uh, we have also assisting us uh, other members of the staff, uh, Jen, Becca and uh, Ben. And before we start with uh, the speaker introduction, I would like to remind you of a few technical details, some housekeeping. So um, as you notice, uh, the session is being recorded. So um, please keep your camera off if you don't want to appear in the recording. Um, also, please keep your microphones off during the presentation. Um, the lecture will be around 30 minutes long and will open for a um, question and answer session at the end. You can type your question in the chat box and we'll go through them at the end. Or if you prefer, you can raise your hand and then during the Q&A session, I will call upon your name. So then you can open your microphone and ask uh, the question yourself. So without further ado, uh, we are delighted to welcome you to the first lecture of our series entitled How Microbes Melt Glacier and Ice Sheets. Uh, that will be presented by Professor Alexandre Magno Barbosa Anesio. Um, Alexandre is a professor in the Arctic Microbiology in the Department of Environmental Science at Aarhus University. Uh, his main research interest is on microbial and biogeochemical bio processes in glacier and ice sheets. He's currently one of the principal investigators in a European Research Council Synergy grant. Uh, Professor Alexandre obtained his PhD degree at Lund University in Sweden in 2000, where he also worked as a postdoc until 2003. And then since then, he has worked at the University of Nottingham, Aberystwyth University and University of Bristol until, sorry, until moving to Denmark in 2018. Um, so thank you for accepting this invitation, Professor Alexandri, and I'm handing over to you now. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I'm just going to share the, the, the screen now with you guys, and then... Um... So I then put from here, and and I guess you can see now the um, in the presentation mode. Is that right? Yes, yes. that's correct. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for the invite. This is really a pleasure to to give this Christmas talk and and so on. And then I, I guess that the Arctic sort of it's nice as a as a Christmas uh, topic as well. So that. Um, so uh, the idea is to, is to tell a little bit about how microbes melt glaciers and ice sheets. And I'm going to concentrate most of this, uh, the talk about um, the Greenland ice sheet, actually, which is part of the project that we are currently working on. And then uh, I guess that for, when we think about climate change, so glaciers and ice sheets are kind of one of these biggest symbol of, uh, of climate change because glaciers and ice sheets are losing mass, especially in the case of Greenland since 2002. So the, you always have these ups and downs here and that's related to uh, glaciers gaining mass during the winter, but and then they lose mass during the summer. And this, since 2002, they have not been balanced. They actually have losing significantly amount of uh, mass. And then especially here on the west side of Greenland. And then, uh, and one of the reasons of course is climate change is, is getting warmer, but there's also a, another reason for that. And this is the, the fact that it's also get darker in the ice. Uh, so one, the first thing is that when the ice starts to get warmer, so the snow, becomes, uh, gives space for bare ice. So it becomes, and snow is not as, snow is very reflective. So a lot of the energy that comes in goes back, but uh, when it comes to bare ice and then some of that is absorbed and then it ends up melting faster. So the albedo of the ice decreases. 
But the other thing that is also problematic is that the ice itself is getting darker, which becomes even more problematic in that case. Um, so for example, this is the classic uh, paper now uh, from 2013 that shows the changes in albedo between 81 and 2000 on the left side. And then you can see that parts of the ice is getting darker here. So that's the albedo decreasing. But it, since 2000 to 2012, for example, it gets significantly darker as well. So one of the reasons is that uh, that people think about if you talk to glaciologists it would be like, and then you can see that darkening on the west side, is that um, you have potentially here uh, so talk, soot from a forest fire, for example, that can be traveled and then end up on the Greenland ice sheets and then that increase the darkening. The other thing is that there's some thinning of the ice and then you have the dust from 10,000 years ago from the Holocene, for example, that it's starting to resurface at the margin. Um, but we are biologists and we think that's something else. It's not only that, not only this is actually probably, it is a cause of darkening, but it's not a significant cause of darkening. So actually, and then this is just a picture to the safer that actually the, the issue of the albedo. Né? So if you have a white surface, a lot of the light that it's coming, it's reflected. If you have a dark surface, a lot of that light is absorbed. And then when it's absorbed, it generates heat and it generates more melting. And then this is a little bit just a, to show actually how the ice looks like. Uh, from the helicopter when you come really close, it's extremely dark. Uh, so in addition to be, of course, a um, place for Santa, it is also a place with a lot of darkening, a lot of particles, a lot of other things. And that's where I want to, to show and convince you that quite a significant part of that darkening, when you zoom into the ice and you start to come close and close, so this is a microscopic view, uh, picture exactly on the ice. So you can see the ice crystals and then you have a lot of those filaments around here. And then I'm just going to change to laser point. So you have all those filaments here and then if you zoom closer and then you have a particular type of algae that grows extremely well on the, in the ice surface. So the you scrap uh, um, a little bit of the, um, scrape a little bit of the surface of the ice, you find these organisms in huge abundance. So a little bit more of them. So this is basically a bag of ice that it's scraped from here. And then you have all sorts of algae there, but it's particularly dominated by those, by this group of algae that are very close evolutionary to terrestrial plants, actually. So this is a streptophyte. And then a uh, generic name is a silonema. So they can come in chains or in single cells, but potentially different species. And you can see that they are extremely heavily pigmented. So basically one milliliter of the ice in a bag like this, we have between 10 to the four to 10 to the five. So 10,000 to 100,000 of algal cells uh, in a milliliter. So this has been the topic of our research in the past uh, seven years uh, with that. And, and we started with a small camp uh, with a NERC funded project to look at uh, the darkening of the ice um, with, uh, with just uh, maybe six, seven people at most in the camp. So now to the recent project that we have up to 17 people in this um, kind of um, camp on the ice during the summer to see the progress of um, the development of those blooms of ice algae. And one of the first things we did back in 2015 was actually to look at just 
not only to look at the presence of the algae, but to look at the activity, because we would like to see how fast they grow as well. So we have just been looking, for example, at uh, trying to look at the activity, primary productivity, the typical thing that you're doing in lakes, uh, measuring uh, with C14 incorporation, and then uh, and a, and a clean ice, which is we call the control ice, and then one with that looks a little bit darker, and then going progression of darkness, and then look at the prime productivity. How much they do photosynthesis, the algae, how active they are. And actually they are extremely active. So when you look at this, the difference between the different categories of ice, the prime productivity, you find actually that production on a dark ice like this is very similar to, to a neotrophic lake. So it's quite impressive the amount of, uh, of uh, photosynthesis that you can find in a dark ice. And that is a problem itself. It's not that they are only growing, but because they are extremely pigmented. So one thing particular about this um, uh, dark ice is that um, so they have a particular set of pigments and that's uh, phenolic pigments, purpuregaline-like pigments. That's the same that you find in the, very similar that you find in black tea, for example. And about more than 2% of the dry weight of the cells actually are composed with this phenolic pigment. And they provide extremely important light control and adaptation for the ice algae to survive in this environment because it actually is very reflective. So what, it's, um, what I have here is a graph with the photosynthetic, the electron transport of the ice algae at different light conditions. And you can see that actually the better the curve, the higher the curve, the better adapted they are. Actually, it's, it's good for them. They have a better electrotransport. And you can see that if you have 100% of light conditions um, in Greenland, for example, you do have a, a kind of, they, they have an electrotransport, but they have, of course, they are not as adapted if you shade them. So if you shade them, they actually, uh, they, they, have a better electrotransport, a better photosynthetic capability. And that's to tell that they actually they are, despite of the pigmentation, they are still under stressful conditions with all the lights that is available to them under the, uh, under the ice. And then of course they have to have those pigments to improve their photo capabilities, otherwise they will be completely fried in those conditions. So that becomes, a uh, small pigmented algae that has a big role. So this is um, the relationship between the albedo. So that's the, the, the that is becomes much lower if you have a high abundance of the cells. And then you can convert that sort of uh, capabilities of their pigmentation. So if you have these big numbers of algae, and then you can also look at their wavelength capability of sort of absorption. And then you have, a, for example, here, the snow on the top and then a clean ice. And then when you have a low algal bundles and then a high algal biomass. So that sort of difference between the, how much the snow is reflected to a ice that has a lot of algae, it produces so it can be converted into melting. And then essentially you can calculate that and ice algae alone produce conservatively up to 13 and 50% more melting and up to 26% in localized patches. So that is uh, just the algae alone is actually contributes to a significant amount of melting in addition to, to the fact that climate change is, is changing a lot of areas from snow to bare ice. And then you have the darkening added by the ice algae as well. So a representation of that is, uh, I mean, typical is that if you look at two blocks of ice, for example, at 10 a.m. in the same day, 
And here on this one, you have some algae and some minerals as well. But this is the dark ice that it has actually a significant amount of algae here against the ice that is clean. And then in the same day, so at the end of the, the day, you actually have much more melting. So it's also, you can convert that to liters of water. And then in every meter squared is about nine liters of water that is extra melted by the presence of the algae. So that makes us to, to consider that actually as well that in the latest IPCC uh, report, so 2021, so now we can consider that uh, the parts of the melting of glaciers and ice sheets are considered as problematic because of this um, positive, uh, positive of field, albedo feedback. And then, uh, and now it's also recognized that a lot of this albedo feedback, this darkening that's caused in the ice is controlled by the biologically active impurities. So the next step, now that we know that is an important process, they are melting glaciers, we want to know also what controls their growth. And biologically speaking, quite often you look at a, a group of microbes uh, or any organisms and you have your bottom-up controls quite often related to nutrient conditions, for example, and other physical chemical conditions. And then you top-down controls that can be related to grazing and um, other biological factors that might uh, control the, bio, the microbial population. So if I start with um, uh, the bottom-up controls, it's quite important because the question here is that if the climate gets warmer, can ice algae colonize new bay ice areas? And that depends on their nutrient requirements because they have to get nutrients and then they, 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 have, they can grow in other new areas that if, if, if it's getting warmer and this snow line is going to progress further up. Um, so for this, I, we had a PhD student that's just finished and, and, and Laura Halbart, and then she did a bunch of experiments using um, C14 and nitrogen 15 incorporation. And basically it's, uh, it's uh, we did that in the south of Greenland, taking, um, um, sorry, this is jumping a little bit there. And then take a bit of the ice and then uh, collecting the upper parts and then melt and then uh, incubate into bottles. Uh, that looks like basically like that in the field. And then doing a 29 hour incubation with this, um, with the C14 and nitrogen 15 under different nutrient conditions. So in one is just the bicarbonated added and then the others, we have a little bit extra nitrogen and then a little bit extra phosphorus as the major limiting nutrients for algal growth. So, and then in this case, we have been analyzing that in a, on a single cell level. So we go for a microscope with, that's collaboration with the Max Planck Institute and then a desiccating um, micro, microscope. And then those cells are then uh, used for, to look at single cells elemental composition uh, using scan electron microscopy, energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy. And then some of that with colleagues in Stockholm for second ion mass spectrometry to look at the incorporation of the C14 and nitrogen 15 on a single cell basis. So that is quite a special because, and then we can separate a lot of the, the sort of the elemental composition between different particles and just really look at on, uh, what happens on a single cell basis with the algae when, um, when they are incorporated, when they are photosynthesizing. And the first thing that we learn is the elemental composition. So this is how it looks like, for example, an algal cell. Uh, look at the amount of carbon inside and the amount of nitrogen inside, and then phosphorus, and includes, including 
knowing now that we can see, uh, for example, a storage mechanism for phosphorus, assuming that phosphorus is the main limiting nutrient, which is quite, quite the, the truth for many lakes and then rivers uh, that uh, phosphorus being the, the sort of the limiting nutrient in many ecosystems. And the mean CP, for example, is uh, what means that is 300 plus one, and the carbon and nitrogen ratio is 24 to one. And then here we have the red field stoichiometry for comparison. And the red field is the one that is the typical CNP used uh, to tell that uh, organ algae is in balance uh, used in the in the oceans as a sort of a baseline for for the carbon nitrogen phosphorus content in an algal cell but we know that it's not quite like that uh, so it is much higher than what is in the red field ratio which means that two things that could mean that they are highly linked by nitrogen and phosphorus or that they actually require a very little amount of nitrogen and phosphorus to grow. Uh, and we think that because of the amount of biomass of the algae on the ice is so high, so actually we think that they probably are not very linked. That's, that's the nutrient requirement that is very low. And then, uh, and we can see that through this graph as well. So here we are looking now at the, the growth rate of the, the cells, uh, and each of those points are an individual cell. So that what we learn from this here is that first of all, is that uh, we can calculate the mean doubling time of the algal cells, and then in average they actually are doubling every two days. The other thing that we learn is that there is extremely uh, large variability. In the, in the growth rates between the cells. You have cells that are growing very little and cells that are growing very fast. And then about 15% actually are not growing at all. They are not assimilating any C14. But when we add nitrogen and phosphorus and, uh, to the system, they actually don't promote any other extra growth. On the contrary, they actually don't do very well if you add too much nutrients to the system. So that also reveals that they are probably very well adapted to those very low nutrient conditions on the ice. Uh, so there's no indication of nutrient limitation for, from that perspective. And we also see, we, so we learned that and then we start to look at the life cycle because we have been trying to culture these organisms on the lab. And quite often we have uh, failed to do that. So when we bring them to the lab, they quite often they die or they are replaced by other type of algae. And, uh, but we had much more success uh, when we start to dilute our media by a hundred times. So now we have those organisms in culture that we, we can do lots of more experiments now with them as well. Although that's quite often the, uh, it's very difficult to culture them in um, uh, axenic uh, without any other yeast and other organisms growing together. But the other thing that we learned from the, our attempt to grow is that quite often we see um, other organisms, especially when they start to die, other organisms growing with them. And then there's a particular type of fungi, uh, chytrids, Key treats that uh, that grow together with them, and then that provides probably our biological control. So we have been starting to look a lot at this particular type of um, uh, organism that is the chytrid mycota that you can see here that you see quite often associated with the algae um, here, and they potentially they provide this top-down control of the algae. So actually, when we have now ice like this, that we can see lots of ice algae, and then we have so many of them that we can actually try to count how many of the cells 
are actually associated with those um, chytrids that are trying to, to that infect them, and probably in a negative way because you quite often you see also the chytrids associated with cells that are not pigmented any longer. So they have probably a control on the albedo impact of the algae on the eyes. And it's also about between 10 to 15% of the glacial ice algae seems to be attacked, attacked by these chytrids. And then it's quite a coincidence and we don't know the direct impact, but we saw before that about 15% of the cells are also dead in the, or dead or not in co photosynthesizing in the in a natural environment. And it could be that that's exactly the, the same 10 to 15% cells that seem to be attacked by the key trees. So that is come towards the, the half an hour. But what I would like to show you to, to, to come towards the end is that uh, the ice is actually full of life. So I, uh, you have uh, in a snow transect like this, this is us work on the snow here, is that you can see different coloration of snow and then you come to the ice and then you can, and they are very heavily populated by different types of algae. So you can see that here you can have the red snow and red snow has a lot of another type of algae, just as much as you have green snow sometimes and you have different types of algae. And then you have your ice here. Sorry, this is keeping moving with your ice algae back here. You have also features like that called the cryoconite holes. And they have also a tremendous amount of life as well. So with a very different type of algae, in here, you have much more um, cyanobacteria than, than uh, and cyanobacteria accompany with uh, different types of, of algae, of bacteria as well, together with the ice and so on. So this is, um, this is a typical picture of uh, if, you, if you do um, DNA extraction of your ice samples, and then you sequence it, you have a very high diversity of different microbes and groups of microbes. So this is based on um, uh, the 16S taken, the full length 16S taken from metagenomes, which also provide a relative good way to quantify these uh, microbes on the ice. So it's a whole biome in reality here. So it's not only the uh, ice algae, uh, that is there, but you have a whole my biome that with organisms interacting with each other, which means that um, and suddenly you can think about the definition of a biome. Quite often, the coldest biome described in the literature, in the geography and biology group is, is the tundra. Um, uh, but we have things that we can completely apply to the to glaciers and ice sheets. So they are basically you have an ecosystem that is mostly driven by precipitation and temperature. And in that case, it's precipitation in form of snow forming the glaciers as an environment, as a habitat. They are colonized by specific communities of plants and animals, and they are interacting with each other. And most important, there are distinct feedbacks between the physical, the chemical, and the biological environment. So actually these organisms, they are changing the physical environment by melting it, for example, but also chemically, because you can uh, look at chemicals around um, those microbes, and then you can see that's very different if, it's, um, if you, you have an ice that is dark to an ice that is less dark and so on that gives you really towards this uh, new, what we like to call a biome that it's, uh, that occupies actually a significant amount of our terrestrial ecosystems. When you think about there are glaciers all over the, uh, in high altitude glaciers, but also in the poles as well, occupy a significant parts of our planet. 
And we have not even discussed the what is under the ice that is, has also an entirely different type of biome there. So hope it, that comes towards the end. And then I could convince you that melting areas of ice sheets form a complex biome with complex microbe interactions that can influence the ice on large scales. And then uh, and, and the problem is actually likely to, to become worse because as glaciers melt and then snow becomes, uh, the snow line becomes further up on the ice, you very likely actually have, um, uh, it is going to be very likely colonized by new algae, uh, which in the end can dock the ice and, and have this positive feedback between the glacial melt and then um, and the growth of more algae. So that's it for me. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you for uh, this amazing lecture, Professor Alexandri. Um, and before we open for questions, I would like to uh, draw your attention to the chat um, that um, Jen will add uh, a link for our feedback form. So we would like very much if you could, um, yeah, if you have a spare minute to complete the form. We'll also uh, post the link uh, again at the end of the Q&A. Uh, so now we'll open for the questions. So feel free to add uh, your questions into the chat or raise your hand if you have a question, if you prefer. So give a few minutes. Um, oh yeah, so I can see a first question. Um, so how do you predict these environments could evolve in the future in terms of biodiversity, dominant species, et cetera? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So, uh, so there is no monitoring program. So a lot of the um, uh, a lot of these studies are because it's so difficult to get sometimes to the ice and to collect samples. So a lot of these studies are done sometimes uh, for a couple of years in one place and then a couple of years in another place. So the um, there is some sort of the generic biodiversity. There seems to be a core biome that sometimes uh, people have compared different glaciers across, across the globe. So in the Alps and then the Himalayas and Greenland. And then you seem to sometimes find that, um, that, um, that core biome. And then what I would predict in terms of uh, biomass, I have no doubts that I think that biomass is likely to increase because I think that the ice is more likely to become darker with, uh, with climate change and more bare ice areas for colonization of uh, microbes. But and then it's how the biodiversity uh, responds to that sort of uh, biomass. And, then, um, and, um, and I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, it's a good question. Um, thank you, um, Professor Alexandri. Um, there is another question uh, coming up is, is there anything we can do to stop or slow the growth of the blooms as the ice melts? And would this be a good idea or would more human interference make things worse? Yeah. Uh, excellent question, and I, I get that uh, also very frequently, is that uh, how do we stop it? As, um, this is a natural process that it's, um, that I, so we are not, it's not like we are fertile, uh, like neotropic lakes, we, uh, we, we can, um, we are fertilizing lakes and then we are creating a mass problem. So while the algae respond to a much broader um, aspect, which is the climate changing, and then they being able to colonize new ice, uh, bare ice areas, and then darkening the ice. So I am, um, I have been bowling with this uh, question a lot, whether we can do anything that would be ethically acceptable uh, to, the, to the situation. And I had once a company that contacted me because they have a biocide that I uh, used in, um, in a wastewater treatment that is very natural. 
and, and it's uh, not chemical, it's just a small amount of hydrogen peroxide uh, with some sort of stabilizer that uh, kills a lot of the microbes. My issue is, is that um, we have seen with the chytrids, so the fungi, that they can act as a top-down control. And at the moment, we don't know if we kill the algae, we kill probably the, also the top-down controls and whether we, where we completely change the natural balance that can make actually the situation much worse. I would think that this, uh, this is the type of, of um, study that is just telling us one of those feedback mechanisms that is happening that we are not accounting for because the algae is actually adding a lot to the melting that is not accounted for the current modeling uh, that people do when they think about the mass balance changes in, um, in glaciers. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you, I don't think you could do anything that would be ethically acceptable um, in terms of stopping the algal growth. Thank you. That's quite interesting. Yeah, it's quite complex, Ray. Right? Um, how to deal with these questions. Um, I have one question as well. Uh, where are the nutrients that the algae uh, need for growth come from? Yeah, thank you, Anna. Uh, so that is, so as we saw, so they need so little nutrients actually for them to, to grow. So I have actually, I probably can show um, a couple of slides about that as well. Sure. But yes. right now I, it's, it's not just going forward my slides, but I can tell oh, you a little okay. bit about, so think about the nitrogen and phosphorus as the two major uh, limiting nutrients for, for the ice algae. So they did very little and you get quite a fair amount of uh, nitrogen uh, in snow, uh, doing snow precipitation. So that it, it's, a, it's a wait for them to get uh, some nutrients. And then the other is the phosphorus that might be associated with those mineral particles that are transport and deposit on the ice. So the, the, it's, there's very little. So when we look at the amount of um, minerals that are in the ice that is exclusive minerals, they don't impact the albedo as much, but they can provide just the amount of phosphorus that you need for them to grow. And then the other thing is that the ability to store nutrients seems to be also very interesting because the ice is melting and freezing um, during the day, even on a daily basis. Uh, during the evenings, it's freezing, and there's freezing and falling uh, aspects. And then when you have that, you have certain of ionic pulses. So you have upper concentration of nutrients and then dilution. And every time that that happens, they might be actually the nutrient amount around the cell might be more than enough for them to, to use it. And then uh, and, and they store them and then be able to grow. And then as they grow, they retain those nutrients on the ice as well, because and then it's in the biomass and then it's recycled. So when you take a amount of ice and it starts to look at total amount of phosphorus and nitrogen, so it's relatively, uh, it's much higher than in a completely bare ice situation. So I think that, uh, and because they require so little, so and then it's, um, I think that's, so that would be our calculations would be that there's plenty actually there for them for what they require to. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, I will wait a few seconds um, to give you time for anyone that wants to type or think about a question. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, I can see another one. Have you observed any adaptations in the organisms that are suffering with the increase of temperature? Yes, yeah, so uh, so that is also an interesting question. So the the ice environment, despite being uh, because we have this uh, increase in temperature, the atmospheric temperature is increasing, 
the organisms are attached to their ice crystals and then um, and then uh, to and and sort of um, and the particles and so on. But it's all in the ice environment. So as the ice melts, so the temperature at the micro niche uh, so at, around the cells is constantly 0 0.1 degree. So it's just about, despite of the atmospheric temperature is increasing. So the atmospheric temperature is increase, just promote more melting. But the, eye, the, the cells itself, they are around this 0 0.1 degrees. And of course, one thing that I, we don't know yet, it's in the, the very, very micro scale, is that the cells are absorbing, uh, they are capturing this the energy from the sun. And then, of course, a lot of that energy is, is converted to heat, um, uh, dissipated as heat. So actually at the cell level, maybe the temperature is, is higher than 0 0.7, uh, 0 0.1, maybe it's even five, seven degrees and so on. But and then they are subject, they do that themselves. So um, when we try to increase this, um, or, um, grow those organisms in, at the higher temperatures that are realistic higher temperatures for, compared to climate change and so on, they do very well too. So at the moment, I would say that uh, increasing temperature is just going to be an advantage for them rather than make them suffer. Okay, well, yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. There's one more question. Uh, would it be possible to shade the areas with heaviest algal load to see if that could control the population and restore the reflectivity of the ice? Yeah, so the, if uh, if you completely shade dark, and then I guess that um, uh, that is a possibility. If you um, if you shade just a bit, and then it's actually better for the ice algae because remember the ice stressed under very high light conditions. So actually, we are imagine that what is going to happen when there are clouds, because. Um, that is one thing that is very difficult to predict uh, under climate change circumstances, especially on the ice, is that how much cloud is going to happen, be more cloud or not. And cloud can do a bunch of things. One is actually shade the organisms, uh, which probably is going to be better for them. And the other thing is that they're going to trap more of the sun as well and then promote extra war uh, heat that is also going to be better for them. So there are a bunch of also potentially a positive feedback there. Uh, but if you completely shade it in, in darkness, and then yes, uh, we have actually, we, we have done once scraped a little bit of the ice and then put a plate on the top of the ice to see and then, um, and and then the ice it's becomes completely white, but it's impressive how fast they go dark again. Very impressively how they go dark again. So I think whatever we do, um, uh, we cannot do at the large scale, and then the recovery time for them is also very quick. Oh, okay. Well, that's quite interesting. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, are there any other questions? So just wait a little bit more. I, I just send the feedback form again in the chat. We we'll really appreciate if you could uh, fill it for us. Uh, just waiting to see if there is any other questions. Just one more minute. Um, and then we can. Um, OK, so I. Um, I, I don't see any more, there's no more questions. We have many, thank you. It was yeah. an amazing chat. And I would um, love yeah, to thank everybody amazing. for the thank questions you. as well. It was really nice to, to chat with you all. Yeah, uh, we really, really appreciate uh, Professor Alexandri for this engaging lecture. Um, and thank you for everyone that attended today. And then uh, one last announcement is that um, 
next year the society celebrates its 100 years of existence so we have planned uh, lots of events and initiatives uh, to celebrate the centenary so yeah we invite you to to have a look and uh, thank you again uh, professor alexander for this amazing talk thank you everyone for joining us thank you bye bye, bye everyone bye -bye.